Well, I'm so happy that you're here. And now we're so happy that you're here in the studio. Yeah, and finally in person. It's glorious. It's Zoom. wonderful. What's more nerve-wracking for you? Is it meeting with presidents or CEOs or being here in front of a studio audience? Definitely being here. Because when you meet the presidents and CEOs and you say something stupid, I mean, they are the only ones that hear it. And they've heard many stupid things in their life, so they'll forget it. But if I say something stupid here, you know, it's on television, everybody hears it, and it never goes away. And... <laughs> but we get, well, let's talk about this book. I'm so thrilled that you've done this. This is your first ever children's book. Yes. Unstoppable Us, How Humans Took Over the World. Why, why was it important for you to write a book for younger readers? Because I wanted to really help them understand the world and help them understand who they are. You know, this is the biggest question maybe in the life of every kid. I mean, what am I? And you know, the world is so complicated and sometimes frightening. Yeah. Like, I, I remember that as a kid, I would wake up in the middle of the night, afraid that there is a monster under the bed. Mm. And this is actually a memory, a historical memory from tens of thousands of years ago when our ancestors lived in the wild and there were actually monsters that came to eat kids in the night. A lion would come to eat you, and if you woke up in fear and ran away or called your mom, you had a chance of surviving. So, you know, knowing this, that it's not, some, it's not something about, you know, you personally. It's part of what makes us human. I think that's important. And the book also connects it to, it's not just about the Stone Age and tens of thousands of years ago. Mm. It's about what's happening right now. You know, you have all these books about lions and elephants and whales, which are really important, but kids rarely actually meet a lion today. Mm. But they meet, say, corporations every day. They meet Google and TikTok and Facebook and McDonald's and Disney, and they need to understand what a corporation is and how to beware of the dangers when encountering a corporation, which is today far more dangerous than any lion. So... You think it's more dangerous than the lion? Yes, I mean, when was the last time that a lion uh, uh, in Los Angeles uh, hurt some kids? <laughs> but, um, you know, TikTok or McDonald's, they, they can be very dangerous. So it's important, I think, for history to connect the past with the present. And uh, the book tries to explain, for instance, what is a corporation, which is something quite complicated. You know, it's basically just an imaginary story. In the Stone Age, you had, we had shamans who told us stories about spirits and ghosts, which we believed. And basically today, we have our own shamans, the lawyers and the bankers, and they tell us a story about fictional entities called corporations, and we believe them, and they become the most powerful, some of the most powerful forces in the world. I mean, when you're on a book tour with, the, with a book like this, is it more fun going on a book tour when you've written a kid's book? Do you encounter different things? Do you encounter different questions from young people? Yes, some quite unexpected questions, like, I don't know, this one kid asked me, I mean, is there a danger that the baboons will evolve and become smarter than us and take over the world and then lock us in, in the zoos? <laughs> and you're saying that's a silly question. OK. <laughs> be worried about the rats, not the baboons. The book covers the, essentially thousands of years of yeah. human development. The, cent the central argument is that we've got a, a superpower mm -hmm. that's allowed us to rule the planet. What is that, as human beings, what is that superpower? Well, the superpower is our ability to invent and believe fictional stories, fairy tales, which doesn't sound like much of a superpower, but actually this is what enables us to cooperate flexibly in very, very large numbers. Millions of people cooperate because they all believe in the same story. Um, you know, chimpanzees can cooperate like 50 chimpanzees or 100 mm. chimpanzees. Uh, you can never convince a million chimpanzees to come together to build a cathedral or to fight a war or to build a spaceship to the moon right. by convincing them in some story, in some mythology. But this is the way that we cooperate. And again, it's not just religious mythologies. It's also um, the economic system. I mean, corporations, as I said before, they are just a fictional entity. They exist only in our imagination. No other animal on the planet is even aware that corporations exist. Similarly, money is probably the most successful story ever told. And money, again, it's just a story we invented. It's not, it doesn't have any objective value. 
like, I don't know, bananas and coconuts and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but we have the greatest storytellers in the world, which are not the people who, who win the Nobel Prize in literature. It's the people who win the Nobel Prize in economics. And they tell us a story. And it's basically the only story everybody believes. And it's worked so successfully that I take this worthless piece of paper and go to the supermarket to a stranger I never met before in my life. And I give them this worthless piece of paper and they give me bananas that I can actually eat. And this is something that chimps can't do. And this is why we control the world and not the chimpanzees. And if you think about, I don't know, a place like the uh, United States today, mm. when people are having so much trouble agreeing on anything, but they still agree on money. It's kind of maybe the last line of communication that they agree on the prices, they agree on money. And the amazing thing about it, it's only in our head. It doesn't come from the laws of physics or biology. It's just the stories that people invented. I mean, obviously, the, the, the midterms are coming up soon. And there's a, a, a countless, I feel like the last four, five years, six years even actually, uh, has been a, a fear of the, the, the state of democracy. Yeah. You know, it's such a polarized country, a polarized world. How does democracy survive when two halves of a country are absolutely telling each other different stories? They can't survive. I mean, democracy is a kind of system that it's like a rare plant. It can't survive under every condition. Mm. There are many conditions, but it's simply impossible. Dictatorship can survive in most cases. It's like a weed. It grows everywhere. But uh, democracy needs some preconditions. And one of the preconditions is that the people in the country they can see each other as their political rivals, but not as their enemies. When two halves of a nation increasingly see the other half as their enemy, that is out to get them, to destroy their way of life, democracy just can't survive. In this situation, you would do anything to win the elections, legal or illegal, and if you lose, you don't accept the results. How does a country the size of America hmm. even begin to fix that problem? And do you think it's something that, that should be at the forefront of whoever is the next president of the United States? Yes, I think this is the, the biggest threat to the United States right now is the threat to the democratic system itself. I mean, there is a chance, it's not a big chance, but there is a chance that the, the next presidential election would be the last democratic election in US history. I mean, democracy... How, what, what percentage would you put on that chance? I don't know, like 20%, but 20% it's, 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 still, it's, still, it's still huge. It was not like that 10 or 20 years ago. And it's a one-way street. I mean, it's quite easy to kind of for democracy to disintegrate into some kind of authoritarian regime. It's much, much harder to get back. Do you think we're going to be OK? <laughs> <laughs> that depends on the choices we make. You know, whether on the level of a country or the entire species, it's the future is not written anywhere. It's not deterministic. History is never deterministic. It's the outcome of the decisions all of us make in the coming days and weeks and months. There is no responsible adult up there that if we make the wrong decisions, uh, will intervene to save us from ourselves. Uh, if we make the, wrong, the really wrong decisions, uh, it will be up to the rats. I mean, come back. Yuval's going to be here when we come back. Come back after this break, everybody.